Uh... Hey, Phil, can you hear us? Yeah, how about, how about you guys? Yeah, I, I can hear you. Okay, can you guys hear? Or is that not loud? So scoot, come like totally scooch in. I think we're just on audio. We're not, not doing video chat or anything, so. Yeah, we got, we got low bandwidth today. Um, no, it's all good. It's all good. It's, it's pretty cool looking out here, but. Uh... <laughs> so, what's it? so firstly, thanks for, for talking to us. So uh, all the students here are like, what's going on? Like, we're going to talk to these guys in Florida. And they're like, what? So it's, it's the modern, it's the wonderful modern technology. So, so firstly, thanks. I, we know that we got, uh, you know, sketchy, sketchy uh, signals and stuff, but, but thanks for taking the time. And this is my coastal and marine management class. And so um, we're actually just about to start talking about hurricanes and coastal hazards. We haven't yet. So this is a fantastic preview for these guys. But, um, ah. but uh, yeah, so we just started. So basically last week was the first real week of classes. So we've been doing sort of intro stuff up to now. Uh, so firstly, you say it, so. It's cool right now. It's no rain, kind of mellow. What, no, no. It's uh, we got a blue sky. My solar panels are uh, are putting out power right now. Um, I've got a special. I've got a grid tied inverter, but it's a special one that lets me plug in. Awesome. So firstly, how did things fare? It sounds like we Miami and the whole sort of East Coast mostly dodged a bullet as compared to what we thought it was going to be. Yeah. Yeah, just one second. I got to send a note to a resident here. Yeah, good, go. He's asking about ice. That's the job of FEMA. <laughs> no word from FEMA about ice yet. Of course, of course. All right. Cool. So, so yeah, yeah. So, so tell us. So, how have the prep? Firstly, how have the preparations been going immediately preceding uh, Irma here for you guys? Pretty well. Pretty smooth. Yeah, pretty well. When when um, when Texas got all that water, I began looking to see if we could get the parking, the private parking garages, uh, set up so that our city residents could use them to get their cars up a little bit. And so we were able to do that. Um, so that was um, that was very helpful. Uh, we got thousands of cars put put out of harm's way. Uh, both from both from potential flooding, which we did not get much of down here, and also from falling trees, which we got plenty of. Right. So what so, were the so I've seen I, I've seen a few trees on cars today. So what were the peak winds that you think you guys got in the last couple of days? Well, we really got spared. You know, we'd started out in in the in the center of the cone with a Cat Five, which is very much like getting getting hit by a freight train. Um, th th nothing survives a Cat Five. Um, and we wound up really in the tropical storm field. Uh, so we were getting, you know, strong gale force winds, um, you know, 60 miles an hour all day long. And then we get the occasional gust that would come up probably um, based on the damage. I would say probably um, 80, 90 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. I, I was just talking to uh, a friend of mine who's now a columnist for the <laughs> well, we used to call the Times Picayune. Now we call NOLA.com for for New Orleans. Yeah. Um, yeah. She just was. Uh, she obviously had experienced Katrina. She just uh, was uh, deployed to Houston to to cover Harvey. And so I recorded a conversation this weekend that these guys will hear in a couple days with her. But but one of the interesting. So she had this comparison of of the Katrina experience and then the the you know this experience, both of which she was in Houston for. Or, or, or she was she was translocated, and one of her comments was one of the most interesting things now versus you know 10, 15 years ago is the presence of social media, and how when Katrina happened, they really ah. felt isolated, and you know obviously the infrastructure and stuff in New Orleans was uh, shall we say leaving a lot to be desired, but 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 even so, you know a lot of impacts, and they felt very isolated. Now everybody is Snapchatting, everybody is tweeting, everybody is Facebooking, and there's there's um, less of that isolated feeling. So, so have you have you guys? How has technology played in these days in, in your preparations, or as the storm was hitting, or that kind of stuff? Well, I watched the the Texas rescue efforts, and one of the things I noticed is they were using a walkie-talkie app called Zello. Yeah, we use that. We use that in the field. So I checked it out. And uh, I listened to how they were using it and decided this was a good thing. So I, I opened up a, a Zello channel called South Miami Storm. 
and I publicized it all over the city on the you know commission meetings and websites, and I sent out email blasts. And so a lot of residents got on it and started trading information, and it turned to be very helpful. Uh, you know, so for instance, somebody said, "Hey, we're, you know, our our radio stopped working, and we need to get a radio. We we tried Best Buy and and so forth, and nobody has them. Does anybody know where to get a radio?" And someone says, "Yeah, Toys R Us has them. <laughs> yeah, they, have, they have seven of them, in fact." <laughs> And a bunch of people chimed on and says, okay, which Toys R Us? Well, it's the one at 62nd Avenue and South Dixie Highway. So off they, off they went. And hey, hey, anybody know where to get batteries? Yep. Uh, you know, the Ace Hardware and the batteries and bulbs has them. And on and on like this. And, and people, would, people would notify me and tell me what the flood state was. Uh, you know, it was, it was great being able to share information. So I think you're right. I mean, the, the tools are much better. Um, I've also been using email pretty effectively to reach out to my city residents. So when I, you know, when it's time to give them information, I'm able to do that. Um, so I've done about seven. And it sure beats campaigning for re-election. Actually doing something <laughs> useful. <laughs> doing something useful is a lot more fun. Um, so, so one of the interesting ones that relates to, to your class is that the county surprised us with an evacuation order. And they said they were zone A, and zone B, which we kind of understood, so zone A is the islands, I get it. Zone B is the coastal areas, I get that. Zone C is inland from the coastal areas. And that was sort of surprising me. And so the zone C is, is broken up into one mile square blocks. And so I could call the county's emergency operations managers and said, tell me more. And they said, well, we got the maps from the National Hurricane Center modeling the storm surge for, for Hurricane Irma. So this is not generic. This was specific modeling for this storm. And they've got, you know, flooding, you know, in these areas predicted. I said, thank you. Um, can, you send me the, can you send me either the software to run it myself or the map? And they said, we'll do. So I got, their, I got the Hurricane Center's maps. And what I saw was that, well, let's back up and give you a little bit of, of South Miami topography. Okay. So Miami is, Miami is built on what we call the coastal ridge. So it's a limestone ridge. It's where Flagler built his railroad. Uh-oh. Here, here's somebody driving forwards and back, now backwards extremely fast on our street. <laughs> In a blue pickup truck with a big dent on the side. Now, why would somebody drive backwards that fast? I don't know. Anyway, uh, so the coastal ridge. So east, so east of us, we've got Biscayne Bay. East of Biscayne Bay is the peninsula that contains Miami Beach. Now, out to the west, we've got Everglades. And the Everglades mostly drains to the southwest in Florida Bay, which then drains into the Gulf of Mexico. But there are these transverse glades that cut through Miami Ridge. So Miami Ridge is really a series of limestone islands. It's karst limestone, um, very, rug very rugged stuff. And so in these transverse glades, uh, you know, they did a little bit of filling and trenching and stuff. And so they're now canals, but they cut through the ridge. So as the water, if, or shall I say, if the water were to come up Biscayne Bay driven by the wind, it would have to go against the shorelines and it would work its way up the canals and into the neighborhoods. Now, I happen to live on one of these transverse glades, so I'm pretty familiar with them. And so what FEMA's, sorry, what... Uh, NHC's map was showing was that the transverse glades were going to flood. And it makes complete sense. I mean, if you push a giant bolus of water up Biscayne Bay, um, where is it going to go? It's going to go laterally wherever it can find a path. So what I did was I, I you know, I used Photoshop and I, um, or I did a, sc a screenshot and I cleaned it up with Photoshop and I used Illustrator and I laid, um, the street grid over the top of the map so everybody could see where they lived with respect to the um, to the storm risk, to the, the surge risk. And I sent that out with an explanation of what the color codes meant. So if you live in the in the blue zone, you could see between one and three feet of flooding. If you live in the yellow zone, three to six feet of flooding, orange zone, more than six feet of flooding, et cetera. And I sent that out to people so that they could see themselves whether their house was at risk. And what it did was it allowed people who were at risk to say, to say, oh, huh, that's interesting. Because, I mean, they always would say, 
well, we've never flooded before, so why should we be concerned this time? And, and so, so I, I wanted them to take it seriously. At the same time, there's people who are sitting up high on the, on the ridge. Now, high in Miami is like 14 feet above sea level. <laughs> Nosebleed yeah. section. That's, absolutely. Absolutely. If you're above 11 feet, you're, you're sitting pretty. <laughs> this place is flat. Um, I mean, I, when I was a, a postdoc at Cornell, I used, used to, I would bike to work in the morning. I would cover more elevation than exists in the entire state of Florida. Um, That's awesome. We, we, did, we, we, we did our honeymoon. My wife and I did our honeymoon in the Everglades, and we're driving, and we're going to look at this one point, and we're driving. She said, I think we pass it. And I said, listen, lady, I know where I'm driving. And she goes, no, no, I think we pass it. Like, no, no, we got to pass Mount blah, blah, blah. And she goes, I think we did. I'm like, no way. The Mount, Mount whatever it was, was, was a plus three foot uh, elevation thing. And it was, I thought it was a speed bump, but apparently it was Mount, Mount whatever. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's Rock Reef Pass, elevation three feet. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we hand out chewing gum. Excellent. Excellent. From uh, pop those ears. But, you know, but now the interesting thing about that is the foot of elevational change gives you more of a biotic uh, zone change than you would see without. You would need a thousand feet of that of, of of elevation change to see the same botanic botanical shifts in in the Sierra or the or the or the Rockies, um, and that is because everything is is changing with with proximity to water rather than than altitude. Okay, so back back to the to the surge. So this turned out to be very useful. A lot of people stayed put because they recognized, hey, we're not we don't really need to evacuate, and um, and other people who who saw they were actually in a, in a potentially dangerous situation, just did decide to relocate. Now, my next-door neighbors saw, saw the evacuation order, and they decided to leave before they had a chance to talk to me, which was stupid. <laughs> and they, drove, they drove across the state to stay with friends in a place called Safety Harbor. Now, no reason why you'd never say Safety Harbor is at the end of Tampa Bay. And, of course, as, as you probably do know, that the hurricane track shifted westwards, Right. Put Tampa right in the in the gun sights. Now, fortunately for them and everybody, the storm lost a lot of intensity by the time it got up there. Uh, but if it had stayed a Cat Four, they would have been uh, wiped out. Um, and and there's some very interesting, you know, flood uh, possibilities down here. Like Okeechobee uh, once was taken by a hurricane. So in October, what happens is the hurricanes tend to tend to form in the Gulf of Mexico, and then. Or, or loop, and they come back across the Florida Peninsula from the west instead of from the east. Now, if that happens, you know that in the northern hemisphere, a uh, cyclone has anti-clockwise circulation. So as, as a hur hurricane passes south of Lake Okeechobee, the leading wind field is from the south to the north. So it's going to push the water up to the north end of the lake. Then as the storm clears, the tailing end of it is going to push the water south again. And you get a phenomenon known as the slosh. So all the water, so you probably did this when you were uh, five and six years old in the bathtub where you push yourself from one end to the other back and forth and you get the water moving until you manage to slosh it out of the tub and your parents yell at you. <laughs> um, well, that's what the hurricane did. So it pushed the, the water to the north end of the lake and then roared it back down to the south end and it killed everybody. It drowned them. Thousands of people killed. Uh, I think... I think it was 26, but yeah, and I've and, and I've got and I've got a neighbor who lost uh, who lost three or four family members in that flood. That's where they lived. Um, so yeah, it's pretty. Uh, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of potential, and you don't, you don't mess around with water. So so what's the what's the overall vibe right now? So one of the hardest things to get, and I think one of the downsides with all the social media stuff is that I mean the upside is that people get to see what's happening, but the downside is I think some of the critiques and the criticism and the politics um, instead of happening a week or two or three after they you know after the event they seem to happen almost simultaneously. So so on the ground I, I presume everybody's being you know really you know neighborly and everybody's helping each other out and all that kind of good yep. stuff exactly so yeah so the you know people came out on the street today with their saws and and i brought out my tools and you know and we cleared the street i mean we had uh we had eight trees down on the street and um and now the street's open 
know, we brought out loppers and chainsaws and handsaws and, and elbow grease and just moved everything out of the way. Public Works came in with their cranes and truck and picked it all up for us. And now the park across the street is still looks like a bomb hit it. But at least now um, the electric company can get his trucks through to service the, the lines that need to be repaired. Right, 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 right. What was the, the mood of the city beforehand in terms of stuff like resilience planning, um, you know, sea level rise, all, the whole cadre of stuff that we um, need to talk about to you know, make our communities, coastal communities more coastal resilient? Was, was everybody pretty much down with it? Was, there, was it well, split? South, South Miami is South Miami's pretty, um, pretty smart city for the most part. And... You know, yeah, most people are down with it. I mean, we we still get the occasional nut jobs who, like the like the former um, the retired geologist who who contacted me once and said, you know, with all due respect, Doctor Stoddard, you do realize that climate change is a hoax, <laughs> <laughs> right? And he had and and he had a lot of books on scientific hoaxes that he was willing to to loan me, um, but uh, you know, but for the most part, people a they get it. Um, and B, they're very appreciative of a mayor who gets it. You know, so I've 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 really felt uh, like I've got a lot of support on that. You know, through the city. Uh, so it's not really you know that's not an issue for us. I mean, the the tricky thing is when you sort of look around, and you realize you're it. I mean, before before Obama really got with the program. I mean, his first administration, he was focused on health care and other issues, and and I sort of looked from my position as mayor, and there was nobody above me who was paying attention. I mean, the, the state legislature wasn't, the governor wasn't, the U.S. Congress wasn't. Um, there were some, there were staff scientists in the federal government who were, but they weren't really empowered to get anything done. And finally, finally, Obama put his eye back on the ball there, or on the ball for the first time, and we began to see some some good policy developing at the federal level. In fact, I worked for the White House writing sea level rise policy. Um, for a couple of years until uh, the the current administration took over, and they took down our website so fast they don't even realize that I still work for them. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Uh, so okay, I'll just say I have some colleagues, for example, that came down from New York, and 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 uh, in the past decade or so, and and uh, to work for some South Florida agencies, water management district, etc., and. Um, they've, they've in recent year, in the last year or so left because the difficulty they've had with the, the state bureaucracy, state of Florida's bureaucracy about not being able to use terms and, 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 uh, and such. So, so is that, do you think, do you think events like this or this specific event can help, help get some momentum in that direction or think that's just sort of barking up the wrong tree? No, I think it abs. It, it already is. I mean, the the there is enough enough popular sentiment right now that that these recent storms have been intensified by by global warming. Um, that there's not much that the politicians can do to stand in front of that train anymore. Normally, politicians like to be in the front of the parade, and they so they figure out where the parade is going, and they run around to get in the front of it. Right. Right. And. Um, and so I think I think you're going to see that happening again with 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 climate and uh, and storm intensity. I think that's I think that's a train that you know a parade they've got to they've got to get into the front of. So they may not really do any serious leadership because they rarely they do. But I think standing and you know standing in front of it trying to make it stop is is um, they're going to recognize the futility of that pretty quickly. Well, one of the things that, that, that at, at, a, at a policy level, since we're talking about policy in this class, at least, at least part of our class, um, one of the issues there is um, uh, one of o Obama's executive orders to essentially, in the wake of, of a disaster, uh, rebuild in such a way that um, doesn't bring you up to the same level you were at before the disaster as, as maybe FEMA traditionally has has uh, chosen that as their focus, but to actually try to make us a bit more resilient to whatever it is, sea level rise, you know, wh wherever the, the case may be. And, and, and famously, um, President Trump, unfortunately, a few weeks ago, um, essentially, uh, I don't know, the, I don't know the legal term is not reneged, but, but, but reversed, I guess, revoked that executive order so that that is, 
is technically no longer executive branch policy. Um, and that seems to be something that people are, are focusing on as, a, as a, a relatively simple thing that could be done that, that could have some significant impacts. But, but is there anything else that you're watching or you're aware of that might be a key touch point to, to help um, you know, go, yeah, go sure. forward? Yeah, sure. Absolutely, absolutely, and, the, and the, thing, the thing to keep your eye on is the national flood insurance reauthorization. Uh, that's, what, that's what's going to take it on because, um, I mean, right now, roughly half the, half the country is at risk of some sort of natural disaster, and the other half of the country is not. Um, now, you guys get wildfires. You can get earthquakes. Uh, <laughs> well, we're we, getting ready for know, some we, giant, at some point we're going to have a massive earthquake, and the, probably not to distant future, yeah. the next few decades, one would say, suspect. Yeah, so you, you, you get, you know, but there's places that don't get anything. And, and so really the question is, um, should the entire nation underwrite the risks of the idiots in California and Florida who choose to live in, in likely disaster zones? Right. And, and build in them. I mean, and build stuff that's vulnerable. Um, you know, so if you, guys, if you guys didn't build anything, uh, you know, sturdier than a, than a pup tent, it wouldn't be so much of an issue, but if you insist on on building things that can fall over, then you know um, you're you're really asking for um, you know the people in other parts of the country to subsidize your risk, which they are doing. Same thing for same thing thing for thing for us in hurricane zones, and so there's going to be a debate about whether that's reasonable. I mean, it was interesting to see, for instance, Paul Ryan arguing against uh, you know reimbursing New York City after. Um, after Hurricane Sandy, and then run around and ask for help with uh, with Hurricane Harvey uh, as soon as it hit Texas. I mean, you know, the hypocrisy the hypocrisy gets exposed pretty quickly. Um, but the, the the question exists nonetheless: is is should um, should the federal treasury keep printing to um, support the lifestyle of people in coastal communities? And I think the answer is ultimately going to be no. Um, you know, right now it's just a political fight because, of course, uh, you know, anybody who tries to rob Peter to pay Paul can always count on the support of Paul. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, so, you know, Paul, in this case, being all the congressmen from the state of states of Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas and so forth. Yeah, you know, all the vulnerable ones. So they've got a fair bit of political clout and they're going to say, oh, no, our citizens couldn't couldn't afford their their houses if they had to pay the actual actuarial risk. Um, at some point, the other states are going to balk and say, well, um, we're tired of paying, so no. Or maybe they will. Maybe they'll say, oh, I guess we'll just, we'll, we'll sure, we'll subsidize you to, you know, and let you let you do this, but I think I think that that's going to be the ultimate discussion. I mean, it, it seems like with a lot of our coastal hazards that um, uh, we we need to the students here, you guys, uh, we here in California, we need to have these arrows in our quiver now. And and what seems to often ha times happen is the political moment is not ready, but we have to have those reports written those those plans ready, those, those policies worded, whatever the case may be, because these, these, these things increasingly seem to be precipitated by these disasters like an oil spill, like a hurricane, and, and it's just sort of chaos, 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 and people, that's the time when people seem to be reaching out for, um, you know, right now people, a lot of people that maybe don't believe in things like climate change, they're sure watching the Weather Channel a lot. They, they sure seem to believe in the uh, National Weather Service right now. <laughs> um, and so, so, so th this is sort of this opportune. These are these opportune times, and it seems like we have to be ready to go with those with those tools, um, maybe more so than in the past. Oh yeah, oh yeah, and you know, and, and I, I'm sure Brian told you I'm a zoologist, not a not a geophysicist right, 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 right. but I, but but I, but I, I read pretty broadly um, and I try to and I try to stay up on stuff that's relevant and I've got I've got friends who are uh, you know reporters for all the major newspapers uh, around the country so anytime I ask them a stupid question I get back a dissertation <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know if you follow the writing of Justin Gillis of the New York Times I ask him a question and uh, and 
he's great. He sends me back an email that has, you know, hot links to all the papers in it. <laughs> so I can sit, I can sit, I can sit in the evening and get and educate myself. I mean, the guy's really phenomenal. Um, and there's a bunch of them like that who are really good, but he's, he's on, on climate and sea level. He's, he's certainly among the best. Look, I didn't even put Phil up to that, but he just said the importance of citing your references. Do you guys all catch that? You see that? Yes, right. See? Always, always reference where you get stuff from. That was good. So uh, I'll open yep. it up so if any of these students want to ask a couple questions, we don't want to keep you too much longer. But, but what, maybe one last one I'll ask is what are you guys most proud of in terms of whatever, whatever um, preparations you guys have, have made um, you know, in the last couple years or... or or approaches you guys have taken that you're particularly proud of? Well, I, probably the, the most important thing that South Miami did recently was that we passed a mandatory solar ordinance, the third one out to Cal. So that so the new residential. So sorry, sorry, Phil, you, you cut out for a second. Solar. You cut out for a second. So you guys passed a, a solar ordinance. We didn't quite hear it. Yeah, mandatory solar. So so new residential construction has to have solar on the roof, and so there's there's five or six there's five or six municipalities in California that do this. If yours isn't one of them, now you know what you need to get done. <laughs> and and South Miami, and that's it for the that's it for the nation. And so that was that was huge. That really, I mean, it was a little thing that we did for ourselves, uh, but it's it had just enormous um, ripple effects through the country. So it's it's been picked up and discussed all over the all over the nation. Um, so that was that was an important little thing. Of course, we you know we did other stuff too. Like I created solar solar bike co-ops. Um, we created a what's called PACE program, property assessed clean energy, so that you can finance energy efficiency improvements for your house and put it on your on your tax bill. And so it doesn't it does increase your nominal debt load, um, and it has some advantage some you know financial advantages for some people. Anyway, we've done we do about a a quarter billion dollars worth of business um, every every year. It's probably going to go up to about half a billion. And we charge seventy five percent, sorry, seventy five dollar closing fee on every one of our finance deals. That money adds up. And so I use that to start solar buying co ops and to put money into low income um, energy efficiency projects. So we now, you know, our our local utility, Florida Power and Light, is has the lowest contribution to energy efficiency in low-income communities uh, of any utility in any major city in the country. So we're now spending three times more than they are on uh, on, low in, on low income. So we, we're doing energy audits in, in low-income households now, and then we come back around again and do the upgrades um, as the audits uh, show are necessary. So I'm pretty pleased with those things as well. So I'm trying to, you know, trying to set an example and, and, and get good things happening on the ground at the same time. Cool, and and how are you guys? How are you guys in terms of water? How are you, are you guys getting a lot of where you are specifically? A lot of saltwater intrusion? Are the aquifers getting tanked where you are? Or? Um, well, the, the salt water is to the edge of our city, city to the very corner. corner. Um, people, people haven't have noticed it yet. It hasn't started sort of killing the trees. trees hasn't really gotten in, yet. Um, but it's at the edge. So, so that's going to be something coming. Uh, one, one of the other things about sea level rise that people don't understand is that. It raises the water table underneath you, so you can be getting sea level rise without even knowing it, and you know it until your septic tank fails. Right. Because when when the water table reaches your septic tank, reaches the drain field of your septic tank, the toilet flushes into the bathtub, and that's what you know. That's when the mayor gets the phone call. It's like it's like uh, mayor. I talked to my plumber, and he says, um, "I need to get you know hooked up to a county sewer. How quick can that happen?" <laughs> That's one of those precipitating well, it, events things. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like uh, you know, can you can you hold it for four years? <laughs> sure, you go down to the subway; it's probably no problem. Awesome. Uh, Any questions? We shouldn't keep Phil too long. Oh, and, and and one more one more thing you should also know about this this area is that the water is six feet below the surface. That seems Typically. deep to me for Florida. <laughs> well. Well, you can come dig a hole, um, but but that's it, it's been it's been a little higher the past couple of days. We you know with the um, you know with the surge we got, it did raise the water table uh, by about two feet. Um, but that's the that's the gist of it. Cool. 
Anybody have any questions they want to ask Phil, Dr. Stoddard? Hello, Dr. Phil. Uh, my name is TJ, and uh, I was wondering what other benefits have you had from uh, watching Hurricane Harvey before uh, having to deal with uh, Hurricane Irma, if any? Well, a couple. Um, I mean, one is it, it really alerted us to the issue of the cars, um, and so we got we got going on that very fast, and and that went very smoothly, and that was a big hit with the residents being able to put their cars in a safe place. And the second thing I'm hoping is that it sort of got Congress warmed up for action, because whenever they're asked to do something, you know, they had to deal with the debt ceiling and hurricane relief at the same time. You know, flap, flap, flap. So I'm hoping I'm hoping this has got their minds in gear um, and in a mood where they realize they have to do things rather than flap their arms up and down and point fingers at each other. So that will that will be seen yet. But I think that's probably another benefit to come from Harvey. And then the third one is what the, the third one is what we talked about, uh, um, you know, earlier, and that is do it do a succession of, of heavy storms like this begin to change the, the conversation in a good in a good way. And I'm hoping they will. That, I, I'm seeing it so far. I had this. I had this one crazy resident, city resident, who um, is has been a, a a rabid Donald Trump supporter. I mean, the guy's the guy's a little crazy, but but nonetheless, like he like he got he got into he got into a fight on camera in a Starbucks as he was because he was yelling at uh, at, at the barista because she had a, a Bernie or or Hillary button I forget which. Anyway, he went up on the news and and made a big stink. So the guy's like Trump crazy. Anyway, he writes me, and I, this is a direct quote. He was talking about these storms. He says, I blink Trump. You cut, you cut he out says, there, I, blame he Trump? says, I, he he says, says, I blame, blame Trump. Trump. And then his next email says, I miss Obama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. So, uh, right. It would be wonderful is, this, if we didn't have this, to have this, natural disasters to change people's opinions, but sometimes I guess we do. <laughs> Never let a good emergency go to waste. There you go. There you go. <laughs> other questions? Anybody else have any other questions before we let Phil go? Hello, Dr. Stoddard. Um, I've, um, my question relates to, um, I was just wondering if the people of Florida consider themselves lucky um, at the expense of Cuba and other small islands that kind of got the brunt of it. Because I know the Category 5 kind of hovered around Cuba and slowed down the hurricane. Um, so I'm just... I guess the question I want to ask is, do people of Florida realize that they are somewhat lucky for the change of direction of the hurricane? Or? We believe we are extremely lucky. Everybody I've talked to knows how lucky they are. Yep. Yep. I mean, yeah, there you go. lucky. Yeah. I like it. All right, good. Just, it's just, you know, it, what we were looking at before was, was a, we were in the center of a Cat 5 cone. And, and not much survives a Cat 5. I mean, if you go and you look on the Saffir Simpson um, scale on the National Hurricane site, it says, you know, most frame housing destroyed. And that's pretty accurate. You know, uh, catastrophic damage is what it says. And I'm looking at downed trees and intact houses. Everybody knows how lightly they got off. And now that, but there's, but you also, you also glanced off some magical thinking. Um, which is something we all have to deal with too. And, and that is like what, you know, there's this hard thing about, about realizing that what you hope for doesn't affect things. Um, you know, I can hope the hurricane misses us. I can, you know, what if, what if I hope the hurricane diverts? Am I, is, are my wishes um, hurting somebody else? Well, the, the fact is, of course, you can wish and hope for what you like, and it really doesn't affect the weather. But we, but we believe it does in some way. If I hoped that the hurricane would, would go west and run over my neighbors instead or, or go over Cuba and clobber the, and clobber the poor people of Cuba, um, and it did, I would feel guilty, thinking, oh, my God, I made it, I made it go over Cuba. Look, look what I did. And this is, this is how children think. Um, but interestingly, it's very difficult to stop thinking that way, even as an adult. Uh, you, you, some, we have this superstitious quality inside us that's just part of how we're wired, that we somehow believe, even as rational as, as we may be and as educated as we may, we may be, we somehow still inside us believe that our wishes change how the world operates. 
and it's a curious it's a it's a curious it's a curious thing to grapple with as a rational person right there's also the issue of uh you know they were talking 12 foot uh storm surge same thing with harvey um you know it ended up coming in with harvey most of the air is closer to six foot and 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 these things so that um sometimes there's also the concern that oh my god everybody get out you're gonna die right when the when the governor's saying you're gonna die because that's what it looked like and then it's not uh you know fortunately but it's not as bad as we may be um, had feared, I think that gives some people that, yeah, okay, yeah, right, these guys were saying Category 5, and look, my house is still, yeah, the, some branches down and stuff, but, yeah, no, we don't need to worry about it that much. So there's always that worry about, one, about crying wolf, and, and then, two, about not sounding the alarm, you know, loud enough, and yeah. that, that, that's a really, really hard thing to hit, but... It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balancing act, and I, I think that the local manager, the emergency managers went a little overboard with their evacuation order. That's, that's my opinion. Um, and so I had a very delicate letter to write to my city residents. I couldn't say, I, I could not, you know, overtly come out and say, you know, ignore this order. Um, you know, that's, that'd be a really stupid thing to, thing to say. And, and in fact, it would make my, you know, potentially make my city liable. Um, but what I can do is I can give them the information and let them make their own decisions, which people always do anyway. Um, and so without, you know, without directly undermining um, the county's emergency services or contradicting them, I said, you know, I, I just told them. We were surprised by this order. I looked to see what was behind it. Here's the information so you can, so you can see and decide for yourself. And I think, that, I think that's, the, that's how you, you thread the needle on this one, is you, is you try to educate people and give them the best information. You got to explain it really carefully so they get it. I mean, don't use... Don't use jargon. Just put it in, in, in very clear English. Um, and give them the information to make the right choice. Because ultimately that's, I mean, in a mandatory evacuation, they don't come door to door and throw you out if you didn't heed it. Um, it's not really mandatory. It's just what they call it. Yeah, So and so you, you're exactly right that there is this balance between uh, between caution and excess caution so what, what proportion of your uh what proportion of your i know you probably don't know exactly but what's your estimate of the number of your residents that actually did evacuate to another up north or another location probably over half half okay a bit over half okay yeah yeah cool all right. Well, I mean, any last questions? We, we've we've kept Phil for a, a very long time. This is very generous. He's he's super busy right now. Any any last quick questions? No. All right. Well, Phil, th thanks so much, man. This was super cool. This is a, this is fantastic for us. I, I know it was probably a distraction for you, but we really appreciate it. And uh, we well, hope you come by and have some beers next time. I shouldn't say that, but but you should come okay. by and say hi next time you're in town. Is what I should say in front of my students. Yeah, beer, beer, beer works too. <laughs> By the way, do you all know the first the first rule of uh, of post hurricane recovery? Hurricane party. Eat the ice cream first. There you go. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, Phil. Thank you. Good luck. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Ben. <laughs>